So welcome back everybody. I hope your brains are not full yet. Um, how much time do I have, Diane? And does it include Q&A? 10 minutes with five minutes for questions. 10 plus five. Yes. Okay. Um, I've, I'm not known to be able to stick to 10 minutes, but I'll try. Um, so I used to have to spend a lot of time uh, explaining why forecasting epidemics is important and doable and useful. I don't need to explain that anymore. So you save me that time. That's maybe one of the very few good things about the pandemic. Um, let me tell you a little bit about our group. Um, you've, you've, uh, our group was started in 2012 and uh, was very small for most of its existence. We had two faculty, that's uh, Ryan Tipshirani and myself, and a couple of PhD students, a couple of master students. I think we were seven or eight people by December of last year or even January of this year. And then the pandemic happened and uh, we grew like crazy. Uh, and uh, you, this is like mid view. By now we have over 40 people. Uh, faculty, including from outside Carnegie Mellon, PhD students, master students, interns, consultants, volunteers, you name it, the whole thing. Um, let me jump right into some tech stuff. Um, there are basically four different ways of trying to predict or to forecast epidemics. Uh, two of them uh, you might consider mechanistic. Um, mechanistic means that we um, have a theory of how epidemics spread. We think we, we understand more or less how epidemics spread, and then we build a statistical story around that. Um, then we estimate a few parameters. Um, the, the most, um, by far the most um, well-known method that is mechanistic is called the comportamental model. Um, also goes by the name SIR model or SEIR model. You may have seen them around. If you looked around the web for people who try to forecast the spread of the current pandemic, 90% um, of them use uh, SIR or SEIR models. Um, it's a very simplified, I would say oversimplified view of what epidemics are. Uh, it's a theory that has been around for at least 100 years. As a, the as a scientific theory, it's pretty good, but as a basis for technology, it doesn't work very well, which is why we stayed away from it. And certainly for forecasting repeating epidemics, it's not, it really hasn't done very well. Um, the other, and the main reason it didn't do very well is because the reality is much more complicated than the story. There are lots of important things that are not captured by the story. So if you go to the other extreme uh, mechanistic view is something that in the field is called agent-based models. It's a terrible name for computer scientists because computer scientists use the term agent to mean something else. You'd, I'd rather you thought about it as individual level simulation. So that means a full blown simulation of an entire city or state or country where you simulate the people who live there, their ages, their household distributions, you know, who lives in what kind of a household, what kind of schools and workplaces they go to, and you literally let them go through the simulated days, just like the, the game Sim, if you're familiar with it. Um, and the nice thing about it is that you can capture everything that you think is relevant to the spread of an epidemic. Um, but of course, the flip side of that is that that means there are a lot of parameters, a lot of decisions, design decisions and parameters, and these parameters are very hard to estimate appropriately from the data that we can measure. So as a result, neither one of the two mechanistic uh, approaches have resulted in very accurate um, forecasts so far. In contrast, a non-mechanistic approach, you might call a statistical, statistical machine learning approach, um, tries to not build too much on the story and listen more to the data. And this is the approach that our group has taken from the very beginning. Um, of course, if you know a little bit of machine learning, you know that you cannot do it to an extreme. You must make some assumptions. But the idea is that you make absolutely minimal assumptions and you don't take too seriously the theory of epidemiology. Um, we have historically done very well. We've been the, the winner of most of the CDC um, competitions that have been taking place annually since 2013. Uh, and more importantly, it's not just that we did well, but if you look at the number two and number three entries in those competitions, you will find that all three or four of them are non-mechanistic. Sometimes they incorporate some bit of SIR reasoning, but mostly they are data driven, which is really what machine learning is about. This works very well for epidemics where you have maybe 20 years worth of historical data to train your models on. But when we come to the pandemic, 
we're in a real difficult situation with the non-mechanistic approach because we don't have much data. This is one of our biggest challenges now. Um, let me also point out that there are different types of epidemic forecasting. I already mentioned the fact that pandemic forecasting is very different than epidemic forecasting because you don't have much data to go on. Uh, but you can also uh, break down epidemic forecasting into, are you trying to forecast across seasons? This is a very, very useful thing to be able to do and nobody has done it well so far. Or you can forecast within season, which is where we have focused uh, in, in our eight years. Um, and within season, you can forecast uh, near casting. That means just the next few weeks. Now casting, which I'll talk about in a minute, and back casting as well as forecasting the rest of the season completely, forecasting where the peak will be, how bad it will be, and so forth. So let, let me talk a little bit about now casting and back casting. One area where um, epidemic forecasting is very different than um, weather forecasting, for example, is that in weather forecasting, the past and the present are known completely. That means we can measure the things we're interested in, and we can measure them to an arbitrary degree of geographic resolution and, and temporal resolution. And in fact, it's a big logistic challenge, but over the last several decades, the world has built a big 3D grid over the entire planet that continuously streams data on temperature, humidity, wind conditions, and so forth. Um, and then you know the past, you know the present, and the challenge is to predict, to extend it into the future. In epidemic forecasting, unfortunately, we don't have the past and we don't have the present, at least we don't have them accurately. Nobody really knows how many people are infected with a particular virus or bacteria or some other condition in any particular city at any particular time. This is not really measurable. Instead, we have to deal with proxy measurements, measuring things that are related to the thing that to the underlying thing that is of interest. So I try to capture it with this uh, sort of a qualitative view that here on the y-axis measures uncertainty and in Weather forecasting uncertainty in the past is, is practically zero, as close to zero as you want it to be. In epidemic forecasting, there's quite a bit of uncertainty about today, and there's also quite a bit of uncertainty about the past. As we collect proxy data and we supplement it and we enrich it and we check it, we learn more and more about the past, so the uncertainty goes down, but it actually doesn't go down to zero. And of course, there's still more uncertainty about the future, but this poses a, a, a machine learning problem because now you're learning not from a uh, well-known past, but from a, you can think about it as a posterior distribution over all possible paths. And this posterior distribution is a distribution over trajectories, not over particular data points, but you can imagine here you have a variety of maybe an infinitely many trajectories, some of them more likely than others. You don't know which one actually happened in the past. So both in real time, you have uncertainty, but also in your historical training data, you have uncertainty. So this is just a hint of some of the problems um, that we deal with. Um, let me jump ahead to um, what we do for forecasting um, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I mentioned that now casting and, and back casting are a significant part of the challenge. And in fact, I would say over the last eight years, more than half of our effort in terms of uh, people time, publications, what have you, went into uh, estimating the present and the past, and then using that to estimate the future, or to forecast the future. In a pandemic, it's even more than that. It's even more than 50% a huge amount of effort goes into trying to figure out what the heck is going on, the different aspects of the pandemic. Um, and then a sub effort goes into taking that and converting it into forecasts. So in our group of 40 some people, we have maybe 10 uh, who are currently focusing on the forecasting. Um, and the majority of the others are working on creating real time indicators that tell us something about the epidemic. What you're seeing here is what's known in uh, epidemiology as a severity pyramid. Of course, remember, it's not to scale. Uh, the number of infected people is a much, much, is a very, very small fraction of the population. The number of symptomatic among the infected is about 70, 80%. The number of people who go to see a doctor varies greatly during this pandemic, but you could, it's, sometimes it's 10%, sometimes it's 80%. Uh, the number of people who go to uh, consult a doctor or a medical establishment then on become a case is 
uh, as you probably know, around 10%, it depends on case positivity rate. Um, and then some fraction become hospitalized and some fraction died. What these green things are, are the indicators that we've created uh, from different data sources and validated them to be meaningful estimators uh, of the size of the, um, this rung of the pyramid in any particular location, any particular county or city or metropolitan area or state uh, at any particular time. And I will end by showing you a current map of our real-time system. So this is the US. And here is a pull-down menu of all of our um, current indicators. Actually, that's not all of them. These are just the ones available through the map. Uh, we have about three times as many available through the API. And you can choose whichever one you want to look at. Um, let's say a mobility measure. Uh, and you can look at it either at the county level, metro area level, or state level. And you can choose any time you want. And you can play around. And I encourage you to go around and play and send us feedback. And I will stop here and ask for questions.